I'll start with an introduction as people kind of get settled, just uh, get myself in the room, right? My name's Asad Khan. I've been moderating panels for the last hour and a half, so I have to keep this panel exciting because I'll fall asleep otherwise. So we're going to make it spicy. But just to recap, right, we started with stable coins. We talked about kind of this gateway into real world assets and tokenization, everyone's first touch point before they enter the space. We then went to infrastructure and scalability. We spent quite a bit of time on institutions and talking about users and how do we get those guys like here and from that perspective. And we're ending the day now talking about globalization and like, you know, global markets really, right? Actually, the practice of entering new markets, whether it's digital asset markets, it's emerging markets, it's something else entirely, right? Um, and I think this is like really a focus on, you know, use cases, on risk. And I would say that these are kind of the institutions I think of when we talk about where are the institutions, right? Um, I want to start just by giving everyone a chance to introduce themselves. It's a frame for the conversations. Jasmine, take it away. Yeah, hi, Jasmine Burgess. Um, I'm COO of Coinbase Asset Management. We are a newly firmed uh, Coinbase Asset Management. We were previously One River Digital. We were acquired in um, uh, March. Um, my background, I have been a risk manager on trading floors and CRO of trading floors since late 90s, uh, when I was the first grad who came out with Excel knowledge and changed everyone on the trading floor from Excel to Lotus, from Lotus to Excel, should I say. Um, so I've been interested in, in that hybrid between technology and, and uh, the TradFi markets for a long time. Um, I moved to the buy side in 2011. I was running Brevin Howard here for four and a half years uh, from the US side and was tapped to spin out their infrastructure and build it again from the Excel, kind of taking that next road to AWS kind of um, UI technology and hand that out to everybody else. So shared sort of technology and shared rails. And it's been my common belief. Now we had five clients that were digital, 11 clients that were on the OTC side of which after 25 years of being on a trading floor, I had no idea what went into post-trade settlement. It is a nightmare. And so I was like, how do we never have issues on the crypto side? Only on the TradFi side. I was like convinced that this is gonna be how we trade everything going forward and thought rather than watch it happen, be part of it. Love it, Love it. Fami. I'm Fami Syed. I am CFO of Parity Technologies. Uh, Parity is one of the biggest contributors to the building the Polkadot network and the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, before joining Parity in last year, I spent 20 plus years working for hedge funds. So I was used to solving for capital market flow issues, how to access a market from an execution point of view, from a borrow inventory point of view, from a financing acts point of view, sediments, all of those things. So to make it as optimized and efficient as possible. So I often get asked why I joined Parity, why work for a protocol, why go and build on a protocol, because I see the opportunity sets that it brings in terms of the technology, um, in terms of not only this space, but in terms of other opportunities in other sectors, um, and also partly to be relevant to my children, who will be using this technology in decades to come. So I'm here to learn, I'm here to get involved, and I want to thank Centrifuge and the whole RWA crew for inviting me here today, so thank you. Hi all, I'm Jennifer Warren. I work for Barclays where I run digital strategy for the markets trading and sales business. I focus largely on digital assets and blockchain, really evaluating use cases for tokenization and market infrastructure changes that will lead to significant market efficiencies, uh, much less on the crypto side. So most of what I talk about today will be really specific to traditional securities and real world assets. Uh, my background is in driving innovation and working with emerging technologies over a number of years uh, in both in the in the US, UK and UAE. And I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Hi everybody. This is Arbil Karaman, co-founder of Huma Finance. Huma is a on-chain credit platform where high performing receivables are brought onto the platform by various fintechs to create liquidity and on-demand liquidity solutions. And about a decade ago, um, I was leading growth efforts at Facebook, trying to get that um, company to billion users. And majority of that was transitioning from the web to mobile and transitioning from focusing on solving first world problems to you know, going and focusing on usability in emerging markets and addressing the needs of emerging markets. So this feels very similar in a way of a transition of an industry that I've also spent some time in, in the 
fintech ecosystem, the three core funds of Huma comes from Earning, um, the leading digital cash advance platform, uh, where we originated more than $15 billion, um, all built you know, on digital risk management and issuance. And a lot of our learnings uh, and challenges working in the TradeFi rails and with the TradeFi partners, uh, we're trying to you know, abstract it away for the next generation of fintechs and um, build all of that again on the blockchain. So happy to be here. I mean, really a diverse group of panels. I really love this. Uh, I want to start, like, look, it's the last panel of the day, or at least for this kind of breakout sessions here, and the theme is global markets and use cases and really adoption, right? But we've been hearing about tokenization forever. I mean, remember five years ago in 2017, you know, it wasn't called real world assets then. We didn't, hadn't gotten that far, but we're talking about these exact use cases, right? I'm going to ask a broad question, but I think each of you has kind of a unique perspective. So within your seat, like, where are we in the global adoption cycle? Like, what have you seen so far? Where are you right now? What are you looking at? What's coming next, maybe? Where are we in that adoption cycle of blockchain and crypto? I would say it's still very, very early. I would say, in, in terms of um, the incredible tech that we've heard all day, um, it's, it's almost like hearing what HTML and all these guys were building before we even had anything that was a commercial website. So incredible, like, foundational work that's still happening. Um, that there are still gaps that are a concern on the risk spectrum. And once there's a concern on the risk spectrum, it's hard as a fiduciary to grab somebody else's money and say, we're going to throw it into that pot. Um, so we're really looking at um, a lot of the solutions that have come out of the market now. We feel confident that the solutions are just there. Um, not speaking for my company, but you know the institutions of like building Web3 wallets, um, having base, having layer twos that are trustworthy, having choice of that, um, you know, is great. We still don't have a lot of the custodian uh, issues solved. We don't have global mobility solved. There's regulations that have come out that are still yet to be tried. And unless you have jurisprudence, people are like, well, if I break that rule, what happens? And if I try and jam it into the current reporting, then what do I do now? It's not just about regulation. It's about um, my obligations for monitoring and all the rest of it. So um, there are too many questions that people have that make it too hard to get in. And they've had that for the last couple of years already with Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all these types of things. So we have navigated a lot of educational sessions together with Kaya um, to help people understand the metrics and the, the mechanisms of how this changes their investment thesis help them understand the risks, but how they're mitigated in the same way. And when it's all too hard, just give them a UI, which is a drop-down menu, and they can buy and sell the same way they always have. So we're working on all of that, but it's still just getting rolled out now. And just like follow up on that, you mentioned Bitcoin for a second there, and I know it's a big part of the business today, right? Do you really look at like Bitcoin and Ethereum as kind of this gateway drug into then the larger use cases within crypto or blockchain, I mean, and credit and real world assets? Yeah, I mean, I have the privilege or misfortune of being the crypto person at all the TradFi con conferences. And the, the, way, the main message we give is just get off zero and understand what, you know, it is to buy Bitcoin. A lot of pe these people either get inherited or get, you know, um, given it through a collateral mechanism or some sort of a bankruptcy estate. Um, so they are sitting on it. They do need to practice it. And um, that is the best way to get into this. And, you know, I think there is a lot of interest in the technology and a lot of people building, but we just haven't yet got that, you know, when they build a bridge from both sides of the river, we just not yet met yet. Yeah. Fami, your perspective, please. So I agree very much with that. Um, in terms of adoption, we're, we've not even touched the surface. Um, and it comes down to education. In terms of if you think about the finance industry as it is, uh, and the institutions backing that, they've been around for over 100 years. They have systems that are, some of the codes exist for 20, 30 years. They have compliance rules and regulatory rules that again, hinders them. And even within a large institution, and I talked from my previous experience, how many of the people actually know what settlement is? How many of the people actually know what capital funding is and how markets actually work in a bank? So you take that organization and those real world asset managers, and then you've got to find somebody who's willing to embrace this technology and embrace the opportunities that come. They have to go and learn about it. They have to then go and educate their teams and then their businesses. So that's a long, process and then you've got the regulatory environment and I think to date 
we're so focused on technology and what the technology can do, we haven't got to the real use cases. And some of the narrative as a build of a protocol has to change in order to bring real use cases, whether it's real world assets or other examples, to this space. But Jennifer works at a bank. She will be able to speak to more about what that education process is and what the adoption phase is. So, please. Thanks, Fami. Um, yeah, so I think if you consider electronic trading back in the 1970s and NASDAQ introducing uh, electronic stock trading, I think we're in a very similar cycle where, you know, that was the 1970s and there are still parts of the market that are being built out when it comes to electronic trading, such as the bond markets, for example, where there are very fragmented uh, markets, lack of standardization uh, and challenging to electronify to an extent. Uh, I think we're seeing the same thing with use cases in the tokenization. I'll speak more to tokenization than to crypto, but in the tokenization space, where from an education perspective, there is still a lot of negative sentiment of, you know, kind of the fallout in 2022. How does that differ from what we call digital assets today? There is a lot of education and a lot of time required to really get, you know, kind of work through that. I think there's also not yet a known mainstream path to adoption, and that's a big challenge because from a sponsorship and investment appetite perspective, it's very costly to experiment, much less to build out dual infrastructures. Nothing is going to move to DLT all at once. We're going to have to have legacy infrastructures in place for quite some time. It's expensive to both build out and integrate those dual infrastructures, as well as externally with the rest of market structure. So, it, you know, I think demand is going to be driven by a few things, by utility. So great, something is tokenized, it's on chain now, what can I do with it? You know, being able to do collateralized lending, for example. Um, the ease of use for end users, uh, for both issuers and investors when you're thinking about the issuance space, is also very important. We don't yet know how this is going to reshape market structure, but ultimately I do think it's going to revolutionize market infrastructure but it's going to take time and a lot of patience to get there. You used a word at dinner the other night, I mean, that I loved, right? From your seat especially, innovation fatigue, right? I mean, we've been talking about this stuff for 10 years, five years, everyone was trying to do it. Everyone was standing up teams five years ago. Five years later, I mean, you know, we've had a lot more mistakes maybe than we've had success, but innovation fatigue is definitely kind of the sense in the room, right? How do you deal with that today? Like, how do you move past that? It is certainly challenging. I think people have seen, you know, DLT around for many years and and the same for AI. I think the difference in the progress with AI recently with Gen AI and, and LLMs, the difference is you don't need network effect to make that work. So this is something that you can develop internally that you can realize commercial value. With DLT, when we're talking about market infrastructure changes, this requires network effect and it requires, you know, our aim is a truly interoperable, interconnected digital market ecosystem. And that takes a long time to replicate what we have today. So it is trying to show the near-term wins, really focusing on what are some of those near-term tangible commercial benefits where you can really demonstrate value to continue that sponsorship and ongoing investment. And I think that's really what the industry is trying to do. Although there are a lot of hypotheses and a lot of testing that's been done, it really is about trying to coalesce around some of those near term opportunities so that we can prove the value and then start connecting parts of the life cycle and value chain over time. Erbil, please. Um, I cannot agree more, especially with the last point of like, adoption is all about not targeting the late adopters. Uh, if you try to do that, you're gonna keep banging your head on the wall and you know, um, will never um, find a way to actually make your way in. Uh, but when you figure out the next set of you know, um, market participants that will actually adopt because the problems they have naturally match the opportunities that's brought in, right, with the technologies and innovations and the use cases that we bring in, then adoption starts looking very different. It looks like, yes, still in the grand scheme of things, we're nowhere close to trillion dollars of market adoption, but there's momentum. And you can see the momentum when you zoom into that next market. And what we have seen on, on the human side, by focusing on the companies that actually work with stable coins and USDC, and their challenges as fintechs accessing, you know, 
a widely contracted credit market can be sold much easily you know, on this ecosystem. And we have seen zero resistance adoption, zero. We have like a large pipeline of customers waiting you know, to actually adapt to the platform because it literally matches exactly the problems they have. And we don't want to tell them what USDC is because they already use USDC for their global settlement. Um, and I think we will find these you know, um, traits of who are the next set of adopting markets and how do we actually you know, just focus on that. Maybe the numbers aren't very big. It's not trillions of dollars, but once you solve their problem, there's going to be a you know, um, snowball effect to the supply chain that's connected to them and to them and to them and to them. And that's why I think we'll get to the next uh, level of adapters. And um, eventually we'll get to the trillions of dollars of market, but we're not here to rush, at least from our perspective. So paraphrasing, we're still early. Still quite early, I would think. Um, long way to go. And then maybe also, you know, I will split the panel here. I'll talk about use cases and then risk and challenges at the end, right? But, you know, Herbal, what you're saying is really that, like, the way to set this up is picking the use case, picking the right use case. A ton of adoption you have to work through. A ton of, you know, education you have to work through. Um, but I'm curious, and this is for Herbal and Jennifer, right? You know, what are the use cases that right now to tokenization? We're talking about that today. That you think matter most or are most relevant, right? I'm sure you guys both have a unique perspectives here, so... So I know it's not as exciting as native issuance, but post-trade is one of the areas that the industry is really coalescing around. We all know that native issuance is the holy grail for full trade lifecycle management and interop and utility, but post-trade is where we can see some of those near-term tangible wins, and that's where a great deal of operational friction is in the markets. And the types of things that we look at are uh, clearing and settlement efficiency, collateral mobility is huge, uh, liquidity and capital optimization, reducing the tie-up of assets in transit is really key when we think about uh, liquidity management. And another area is, you know, looking at intraday markets is, is really interesting. So repo is a huge market, around $3 trillion uh, U.S. Uh, funding per day in the U.S. markets. Uh, very highly opaque in the bilateral space versus the tri-party space, and around half of repo trades are done bilaterally. They're also largely, uh, the most common maturity is less than a day, so overnight. And what that means is potentially intraday markets could serve those needs. So for clients that are looking to raise fu intraday funding, you can basically pay for what you need when you need it. So that's a you know, potentially new use case that we can't currently offer. Uh, beyond repo and, and general pros trade, I think looking at the broader bond market, which I spoke about before, where there are certainly inefficiencies. And there's been a lot of healthy debate today around private markets. And I personally believe that private markets is a phenomenal use case. What I don't know is how long it's going to take for the traction to really build, because if, you know, it comes down to the quality of assets that are there, the ease of, of accessibility uh, from an investor perspective, education of RIAs or investment advisors who really manage a lot of the private wealth. Uh, when you think about private companies as well, the need for secondary liquidity, the fact that companies are staying private longer than ever, on average now around 11 to 12 years, there's a limited access for investors that are limited to public market investments, and, and there's a large tie-up of value in those companies. So I think those are all really interesting use cases. Uh, someone said today, and it was a really interesting point, to uh, start with the more well-known use cases where there are high volumes and lower risk, such as the bond market, as an example, versus going to private markets or in private asset management, look at trying to fix some of the inefficiencies on the institutional side first and then rolling that out to your more individual wealth or retail clients. And I think that's probably a good approach. We'll come back to your watch in a second because I think Jasmine, we were talking earlier maybe or maybe last night, um, you know, there's a big debate about do you start in liquid markets or do you start in liquid markets to build your solutions? And, you know, I don't know what the right answer is. I have my own guess, but I mean, I think we were talking about this as well. Yeah, not, to, not trying to dishearten anybody, but um, definitely agree with the, where there is like a rubber stamp and you're doing it 400 times a day, that's where you apply the tech because if you're saving a minute that many times, then you're definitely going to repay the, the ROI on, on changing things to tokens. Um, privates, 
I, we have a, like a chief risk officer of all the buy side, uh, uh, like catch up every quarter or three times a year. We've been doing it for 11 years. I've got the CRO of Apollo, KKR, all of the different privates. And I sit there and I say, okay, we had a just absolute smozzle of the pr public markets last year. How are you re like marking the valuation of all your privates? And it was sort of like, oh, we do it a little bit. And then I don't know how to stress it. So I go to the deal team and the deal team and I work out how to stress test this 400 page fat like private equity deal. And I'm like, great. So you've been in the markets for 30 years. You're a CRO of an incredibly huge organization. So you've got the caliber of that, but yet you still need the deal team to help stress it. How the, are we going to give that to retail? It know. is not going to happen. Um, these people are not going to say, I'm going to get myself through this 400 page doc, but I'm going to save friction by not say, like I'm going to you know, buy and sell it on a, a DLT rather than just sign a two page doc. Like it, the, the privates is not going to be where we start. Yeah, if you don't mark your assets, you know, that's, that's where all the problems stop, right? It's a lesson we've learned from, oh, maybe not, maybe not, anyways. But Herbal, talking about emerging markets, right? That's the use case you guys are looking at today. I'd love to hear that perspective, how you think that's going, what, you know, what's, what's going on from the ground there? Yeah, definitely we're much more focused on the emerging market use cases and the long tail use cases, um, even though obviously a lot of the, I think, headroom is still in the public markets. The reason why we did that is because we've seen these three areas of problems where there was a huge inefficiency and again, a huge demand for adapting the solutions. One is cross-border payments and remittances. When you look at uh, that industry and how it operates, when you go and you know want to send money to, let's say from US to Mexico, uh, the, the, the company that takes your money, the money you know, service business, need to find a partner in Mexico to actually distribute that money to. And they can't just, you know, wire that money to Mexico. They need to actually keep funds always, you know, flowing and pre-funded in Mexico, you know, in a way it's accessible by their partner to be able to, you know, have the partner issue it to the, you know, borrow um, the other, other end of the um, uh, remittance, um, uh, you know, transaction. And that creates a $2 trillion of, you know, um, United States dollars locked in, in all these, you know, pre-fund accounts. And there's a highly capital efficient, highly capital operationally intensive um, solution that these companies don't have a way to compete with the large you know, remittance networks that are still charging 78% for remittances, which is crazy. So we have seen a solution where actually, you know, with partners like ARF, they're able to provide on-demand liquidity. So anybody, you know, who is trying to send money to Mexico, all the partners can be on the Circle platform using USDC. It all settles in USDC. No one has to pre-fund anything, and liquidity can come on demand um, by tokenizing these, you know, remittances and receivables on chain. And it solves a huge pain point for every single participant. They don't care, you know, about the solution coming from blockchain, but they care so much that actually their funds now are free, and they can be more capital efficient, and they can operate, you know, with the confidence that, you know, they don't need to miss payments uh, because their licenses can be at risk if they miss payments, right? So there's a huge solution for emerging markets. Second one that we saw is more in the domain of um, the um, credit card, you know, settlements. We have seen Visa just announced that they're going to accept USDC and we'll see this happening in a lot of the other, you know, stable. Yeah, exactly. It's an amazing solution because if you drill down to the depth of like how credit card issuance and settlement happens, there are just so many parties involved in that. And again, it's a capital efficient solution. You need to make sure your funds are there when the, you know, the issuing banks and the visa is trying to settle that transaction. And it's just a you know, massively um, uh, a big problem uh, for card issuers and issuing banks and, and the networks. And it keeps the cost high, which means the merchants who are utilizing those platforms need to give up higher percentages to accept credit cards and they can't do that for small transactions and that slows down the global economy, you know, substantially. So there's another great use case we've seen, you know, um, card issuers are coming to our platform, issuing that in a tokenized way, on-demand liquidity is right there, they can settle in USDC 24-7. They don't need to wait for the night or the weekends, you know, when the banks are closed. No, I love that, I love that. Yeah. Flipping now to like another side, right? So. Beginning of the panel, we talked about where are we in adoption? We're still early, right? Talk about use cases, got a pretty good overview there. I think some fascinating perspective coming at it from the, you know, repo and intraday markets, largest markets in the world, trillion dollars per transaction, and then coming at it from 
well, trillions of dollars of actually users lock capital, capital inefficiencies, right? Fascinating perspective. But, you know, Fami, you're on the operating side. You're helping, you know, you're one, operating as a Web3 business. You're also helping other businesses come in and build. And you deal with kind of the friction, like, right up front, right? From a risk and challenge perspective, right? We're talking about adoption and education. How do we get people through this? I'd love to hear your perspective on how you view that. Like, maybe take it a step deeper. It's not just technology risk. There's, like, you know... There's real challenges here, but how do you also solve them too? How do you think about that from your seat? So um, I think about efficiency. Efficiency, accessibility, interoperability, those three key words. Uh, so we talk about instant settlement in the blockchain, but instant settlement isn't enough to bring financial institutions to come and build on the blockchain. So we've got to make it easier and simpler. So. Today, we've announced that USDC has come to Polkadot. And USDC has adopted Asset Hub to bring, or Circle has adopted Asset Hub to bring USDC to Polkadot. And for us, that's a mature sort of uh, proof of concept around that system parity. Because it brings one channel, one corridor, one gateway to our entire ecosystem of parachains and all the applications that build on top of that. Now, in terms of education, when I speak to people, I use the example of ADRs. So in the US, I'm, I'm, I'm from the UK. So a UK company will issue, let's say, GlaxoSmithKline, a large pharmaceutical company, will issue shares on the London Stock Exchange. But in order to access liquidity to the largest capital market in the world, the US, they will self-custody some of those shares and issue an ADR on the New York Stock Exchange. So that translates to native token, native blockchain, foreign blockchain, foreign token. Asset Hub gives you that accessibility. That's what Circle have adopted. They have taken their real-world asset, which they publish on a trust mechanism every month, issued a token onto Polkadot, which now all of the parachains can access in a seamless way. And then for parachains like Centrifuge, it allows them to utilize that to access the market beyond. And that simplifies process. That simple technology, blockchain technology, nobody has to know about it beyond that integration. But I'm talking about it because it will allow potential opportunities for other digital assets, other real world tokens, other solutions to come into a large interoperable ecosystem like ours. And then, last week in Singapore, we announced a partnership with Zodia Custody, an institutionally backed, bank-grade digital custodian. And part of the reason we're partnering with them is, again, we look at the current capital inefficiencies of blockchain and trading on blockchain. There's a lot of pre-funding of trading on exchanges, which is collateral inefficiency, yield inefficiency, liquidity inefficiency, counterparty risk, credit risk. So we talk about blockchain solving for problems, in the real world and how that works, but in itself has introduced inefficiencies. And therefore technologies such as ourselves within Polkadot and how we build and all the parachains that build within that have an ecosystem that I think with partners like Zodi and other custodians that uh, we're in discussions with can help solve for some of those capital market inefficiencies. You, you know, there's a word you use in their interoperability and you used it a couple of times, right? I think about the whole point of what we're doing here, why we're all here in the room is that it's like revolution in market structure, right? Revolution in financial market infrastructure. We've talked about this in the panel prep call. This is really what's like motivating us all to be here. It's been kind of the underlying theme of all of this. And, you know, we talk about fragmented, siloed, you know, illiquid opportunities. That's what we have in the traditional kind of rails and stuck in that Web2 environment. We move to Web3, we get interoperability. But then you pointed out, we've almost recreated these liquidity silos by now having different networks, now having to solve the bridging problem, solving the asset problem. I mean, how do you think about interoperability in a Web3 context and solving that problem? So again, I think Polkadot, the white paper, was written and designed by Gavin Wood with interoperability in mind for it to be a blockchain of blockchains, for it to allow seamless messaging between different protocols, different solutions, um, each providing their own service. So it's the interchange of messages in a secure way within a single consensus. It's the exchange of tokens, which is proof of, it's more than a proof of concept within Polkadot. 
Um, so in that respect, that interoperability exists. And through Asset Hub, there is an ability to bridge into both real world tokenizations and into other digital blockchains and bring it into an ecosystem that is which core tenant was interoperability. Um, and it allows for compliance within by whitelisting of assets. So again, Circle have adopted that technology so they can only hold USDC in their wallets. And with that technology, they can only send USDC to consented parties. So that creates a level of compliance that was important to Circle. And that already existed within Polkadot. So we just used that technology and they've embraced it to prove what we already knew we had. And I think once others recognize that power and that importance and benefit of that, then there's other solutions that could exist and be built for within Polkadot. Love that. It, Jasmine, you know, you're in firmly in the operator seat on the asset management side of the business, looking at this new world, right? Incentivizing, talking to new capital, it's interested in coming in. What are the challenges you see? And then how do you think about solving those challenges from where you see it? All right, long list. Um, so where, where do we <laughs> start, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has been solved in many different iterations. So even interoperability, um, in a bearer token market like crypto, that is a big bridge issue. Like if you're bridging, um, you've got wormhole risk. If you're, um, you know, looking at trying to do account abstraction, bring all the information down, send an information over in some sort of secure way and via an oracle, um, you're still trying to work out how to transfer value securely. So interoperability isn't, you know, the thesis, it's, it's how do you do it in a secure way? Now, there are two kind of versions of tokens, or three if you want to think about DeFi, but uh, there's the asset reference token, which is where we're all going to start, right? That means I'm printing a token, I have on an ownership ledger that I own that thing over there. But that thing is vaulted and it can't be touched. You lose the keys to this, it's kind of like coat check. We'll find your coat again, right? No worries, we'll, we'll print it again. Now, for me to spend to send that like coat chat token, I can interoperability do that to the, the like you know to the cahoozers. It's like me sending my credit card and doing it on many different websites. You know what? If someone gets my credit card details, I'll print a new credit card. I'll just keep burning my wallets and keep doing it. But my identity is over here, and my assets are over there. When we get to on-chain. Uh, securities, that's very different. That's when interoperability is an issue and the security wrappers and everything that go along with it is an issue. Now, a lot of people are solving it by just going, stick with EVM, go with a trusted base two layer like a polygon or a base, if I can throw that out there, um, and then build a, th a, a layer three on top of that if you need a permissioned area. Permissioned private chain layer three on top of something that is a layer two on a private blockchain. So you've got scalability, security, scalability, privacy. So when you then finally get um, comfortable with the public chain, you can collapse it all and start having your interoperability. But for now, it's like putting your four-year-old on a, a onto a bike. You're gonna put a special little area you're going to put training wheels on and you're going to say, I'll catch you if you fall. Um, so we're doing that. That's where we're at. Um, you're not taking the training wheels off. We're not letting them do, do jumps over the um, street. We're not putting them on a motorbike, right? So we've got baby steps to get to where we need to, and that's where we're starting. So interoperability, I don't see being the issue for the arts, the effort, asset reference tokens. What we do have is um, feedback that the life cycle is just too complicated for people to get their head around. What am I going to do with my ops team? If I have an asset and it just needs that tweak, then Johnny in back ops just does a line item in the spreadsheet. How do I do that in the smart contract? Do I have to get a smart contract developer to tweak it every time? How do I trust the data coming in? How do I transfer it between you know my client and me? Is that instantaneous settlement? How do we do DVP? I can't do DVP, I need to do DVD. Are they holding all their assets on chain? I'm not. So we have to move all of our payment rails on chain, which we're doing, that's the first step. So digital tokens, we've heard it. JP Morgan are doing it. City have come out in the last couple of days saying they're gonna digitize their deposits. Fantastic, now we have cash. 
We've got cash to run around, you know, in the digital ecosphere and pay for these investments. Now, the investments need to be trusted. So we're going to start with really boring bat shh. Um, I didn't say the I. Um, boring, boring investments, money market funds, enhanced yield, okay, and keep it at that. Where we're going, though, is I want to see the 42 middlemen that are creating an ETF that you need $4 billion to put on a public market, which means you're not getting the investments you want, which means you're exposed to systemic risk that you don't want, you just want a really good investment, diversified variants coming to market. We're, we're going to get there. It's going to take a couple of years, but we're starting with really baby steps. I love it. I mean, look, a four-year-old on a motorcycle it could not be the better metaphor to describe this industry for the last five years, I think. So <laughs> I'm going to keep that. And then we'll, I should put coat check token in the definitions of the zine. So.